Today's podcast was recorded yesterday. If you want to listen to my podcasts commercial free the day I record them, go to petershift.locals.com and sign up. It only costs $5 a month. Today's podcast is sponsored by Indeed. Indeed makes it easy to connect with your applicants. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. And Indeed's doing something no other job site has done. Now with Indeed, businesses only pay for quality applicants matching the sponsored job description. Visit Indeed.com slash Peter to start hiring right now. Today's podcast is also sponsored by Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile is for people who hate their phone bills and are ready to cut the ties to big wireless. Cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free at mintmobile.com slash gold. The day after we got that hotter than expected 1.3% increase in June consumer prices, 9.1% year over year, The next day, we also got a hotter than expected increase in June producer prices. The markets had been expecting producer prices to rise by 0.8 tenths of a percent in June, and that would have matched the 0.8% increase in the prior month. The range of expectations was from 0.6 to 0.9. Instead, we actually got an increase of 1.1%. And the year-over-year increase, which was supposed to come in at up 10.4%, which would have been better than the 10.8% from the prior month, and was expected to range anywhere from 10.4 to 10.9, it came out at 11.3%. So an 11 handle on the producer price index. And again, what does this tell you? It tells you that there is more upward pressure coming on consumer prices because producer prices are clearly a leading indicator for consumer prices. Because before businesses can pass on their higher costs to their customers, they have to experience those higher costs themselves. So generally, the producer prices go up and then the producers respond by raising consumer prices. And again, you have all these people like Elizabeth Warren claiming that it's the producer that is gouging the consumer, but these numbers belie that claim because producers are seeing larger increases in their costs than what they've been passing on to consumers in the form of finished good prices. So it's not true that this represents price gouging. If anything, the consumer is still gouging the producer because the producer is eating part of the price increase in diminished margins, which has also been a problem for a lot of the companies that have been dealing with rising costs and that have not been able to fully pass on those increased expenses to their customers in the form of higher prices, though higher prices have been passed on and they are being paid. But I've been pointing out that I think the true increase in the consumer price index is more likely double what the government is actually claiming. On the last podcast, I pointed out that if the official number is 9.1, it makes more sense to me that the actual number is 18.2. And as it just so happens, if you look at the import-export prices for the month of June, you'll see that export prices rose by 0.7% on the month and are up 18.2% year over year. Now, believe it or not, that's actually an improvement because in the prior month, Export prices were up 18.9% year over year. But let's look at that 18.2% because to me, that number is far more reflective of the year over year increase in consumer prices in the U.S. than is the 9.1% year over year increase in the official CPI. And the reason is that the export prices are the export prices. 
There's no substitution. There's no hedonics. There is no way to manipulate the numbers. It's just what goods did we export and what prices did we charge? That's it. And that is a real number, unlike the CPI, that is a completely contrived, made up number where you have a formula that's basically been reverse engineered to come out with a lower number. There is no such formula with respect to export prices. In fact, we don't have that formula on import prices. Import prices are up 10.7% year over year. That still exceeds the official 9.1% increase in consumer prices measured by the CPI. So even that number is more honest. But the reason that import prices are only up 10.7% is because of the strong dollar. I mean, the dollar has been on a tear. Once again, this week, the dollar index rose from 107 to 108. And in fact, the intra-week high was 109.3. So the dollar is surging. It's near a 20-year high against the euro. It's at a 24-year high against the Japanese yen. And it's because the dollar is so strong that import prices are only up by 10.7% on the year. Because if the dollar wasn't so strong, import prices would have got up a lot more than that. And that would have spilled over into the CPI. So, but for the strong dollar, we would have much higher inflation numbers uh, than the ones we're dealing with. Now, it's obviously working in reverse in Europe and Japan, whatever they're importing from the United States, and obviously they don't import as much from us as we import from them, but the prices that they're paying, they're probably up like 30% because of the weakness in the euro and the Japanese yen. So their weak currencies are exacerbating their inflation problem, whereas our strong currency is mitigating our inflation problem. But of course, the whole thing makes no sense whatsoever. We have got the highest inflation in 40 years, yet we have the strongest dollar in 20 or 24 years. How can that be? How can the dollar be so weak and yet be so strong at the exact same time. Because if you think about what inflation really is, it's about the loss of purchasing power of the dollar, at least inflation in the United States, because that's the currency that we use. And so if our currency buys less, that means the currency is weakening. It is losing value. We need more and more dollars to buy the same quantity of goods and services. I mean, think about it. Let's say the US government just mailed everybody a stimulus check for a million dollars. Would we all be rich? Of course not. We'd all have a million dollars, but nobody would be any richer than they were before the stimulus checks arrive. And that's because the limiting factor is not the quantity of money. Apparently, there's no limit to that. The government could just run them off the presses. The limiting factor is the availability of goods and services to buy. And if the government sends everybody a check for a million dollars, but the factories don't produce any more products than they were producing before, if service providers aren't providing any additional services than they were before, what happens? Well, the only thing that can happen is that prices have to go up so that Americans end up buying the same quantity of goods and services. They just pay a million dollars more to buy them because each dollar that they have has less value. And that's basic supply and demand. I mean, as the supply of anything goes up, demand being equal, the value of that thing has to come down. So if you double or triple the supply of dollars, well, the value of each dollar is going to lose a commensurate amount of value. And that is what's happening in the United States. It's not really that prices are going up. Prices are staying the same. The dollar is going down. And so now you need more dollars to buy whatever it is you're buying. And so that is what's changing, the value of money. But at the same time, the dollar is losing all this value, it's never been so strong. It's never been gaining more value 
relative to other foreign currencies. So that is the dichotomy. It's a tale of two dollars. You have the domestic dollar that is weak and losing value, and then you've got this international dollar that is strong and is gaining value. Now, that international exchange rate of the dollar is somewhat helpful to Americans in that it's keeping a lid on imports, but overall, the weakness in the domestic dollar is far outstripping the strength in the international dollar. So it doesn't really help Americans that much that their dollar goes so much further in Japan or in Europe. I mean, after all, it's not like you can hop on a plane and fly over to Tokyo to get a haircut. The cost of the transportation, the cost of the hotel is going to far outweigh the benefit that maybe that haircut has actually gone down in price relative to a haircut here in America that has gone up in price. So it's really not helping Americans out. They're still suffering from a weak dollar, even though you've got the strength of the dollar. One of the greatest feelings that you have as an entrepreneur is putting together a team that cares as much about fulfilling your dreams as you do. And if you want to build that team faster, there's no better hiring partner than Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. So instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Find great talent fast through time-saving tools like Instant Match assessments and virtual interviews. With Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed data. Even better, Indeed's the only job site where you only pay for applicants who meet your must-have requirements. Indeed is an unbelievably powerful hiring partner delivering four times more hires than all the other job sites combined, according to Talent Nest 2019. Join the more than 3 million businesses worldwide who are already using Indeed to hire great talent fast. One of the best things about Indeed is that it lets you do all your hiring in one place and Indeed puts you in control of what you pay for. You set your must-have job requirements and then only pay for the applicants who meet them. There's a transparent flat fee per application and you can pause your job posting whenever you want. In fact, Indeed is the only hiring site that makes that commitment. Now with Indeed, businesses only pay for the quality applicants who match their sponsored job description. Visit Indeed.com slash Peter to start hiring right now. Just go to Indeed.com slash Peter. That's Indeed.com slash Peter. Terms and conditions apply. If you're hiring, then you need Indeed. But the question is, why would the dollar be so strong internationally when it's so weak domestically? Because after all, the U.S. dollar is only legal tender here in America. And so the international exchange value of the dollar should reflect its purchasing power in America where it's legal tender. In fact, if you go back to the 1970s, that's the inflationary decade that we're now reliving, only worse. But if you go back to the 1970s, the dollar was very weak. The dollar lost about 70% of its value during that decade. You look at currencies like the Deutschmark, the Swiss franc, the Japanese yen, the dollar was destroyed against those currencies over that decade. The dollar didn't rebound until 1980, 1981 timeframe when Volcker really got serious about fighting inflation and we had interest rates that were allowed to rise as high as the market wanted to take them. And the market took rates up to 20% when the inflation rate was no higher than 13.5%. And of course, that was a far more honest 13.5% than the 9.1% that we have today. So it wasn't until that point in time that you started to see the dollar rebounding from the complete collapse that it experienced during the 1970s. And it's not like interest rates weren't rising during the 1970s. They were. They were rising more than they're rising now. It's just that they weren't rising enough to compensate for the loss of value of the dollar 
by inflation. We didn't have positive real rates until Volcker, but rates were less negative in the 1970s than they are right now. So from that perspective, the dollar in the 70s should have been more appealing than the dollar today because the interest rate that you were able to earn offset a larger percent of the loss the dollar was experiencing due to inflation than it's offsetting today. Also, you have to remember that the balance of trade position of the United States during the 1970s was far superior to what it is today. I mean, in the 70s, we were still running trade surpluses. We still manufactured all sorts of stuff that the rest of the world needed dollars to buy. And in fact, during the 1970s, the U.S. was still the world's biggest creditor nation. The world owed us a lot of money. We did not owe the world. But fast forward to today, not only are we running massive trade deficits, but we're running record high trade deficits. Our trade deficits have never been as large as they are right now. And America is not only no longer a creditor nation, it is not only just the world's biggest debtor nation, but it owes more debt than all the other debtor nations of the world combined. That's how broke the United States is. So given our financial position today and how much weaker that position is than it was in the 70s, the fact that real interest rates are even lower than they were then, and inflation is probably much higher if accurately measured. And of course, we have this gigantic ticking time bomb when it comes to a $31 trillion national debt that we didn't have during the 1970s. It didn't even get to $1 trillion until 1980, but most of that debt in the 70s was 30-year government bonds. It wasn't 30-day T-bills or one-year T-bills like it is today. So we didn't have this ticking time bomb in debt the way we do today. So if you look at everything from a fundamental perspective, today's inflation should be exacting an even larger toll on the value of the dollar relative to other currencies than it was back in the 70s. Yet the opposite is happening. Inflation is actually turning into a boon for the dollar. The weaker the dollar is in America, the stronger it becomes overseas. Now, why is that? Where is all this demand for dollars coming from? Clearly, you don't need dollars to buy U.S. exports because we have record trade deficits. The demand is coming from speculators. See, here is the situation for the dollar. Right now, the dollar is acting as an inflation hedge for everybody outside the United States. It's not an inflation hedge inside the United States. You can't buy the dollar to hedge inflation if you're an American living in the US because there's no hedge. The dollar is losing value. And even if you deposit your dollars into a bank account and you manage to get 1% interest, you know, the Fed funds rate now is one and a half. And the rumors are that this month, the Fed is going to raise rates by a full 100 basis points, not just the 75 basis points they did last time, but a full 100 basis points, which would bring interest rates up to 2.5%. Now, clearly, that's better than zero. But when you have inflation at 9%, that's still a negative real rate of 6.5%. So not an inflation hedge there if even after your yield, if you could even get 2.5%, you're still losing 6.5% of your money. But that is not the dynamic that Europeans are looking at or the Japanese. From their perspective, yields in the U.S. are very positive because they're looking at the appreciation of the U.S. dollar. Americans are dealing with the depreciation of the U.S. dollar. But if you're in Europe, you don't see that. You've seen the dollar up maybe 15% this year. So if inflation in your country is 8%, but the dollar is up 15%, you're 7% ahead of the game 
by owning U.S. dollars. Then the 2%, 2.5% yield, that's just icing on the cake. That's not a negative yield. That is adding to the positive yield. So the dollar is an effective hedge against inflation for everybody who's not in the United States. And that's a lot of people. Inflation is a worldwide problem. And for everybody outside the United States, it looks like the dollar is the solution to that problem. And of course, it becomes a self-perpetuating process as people buy the dollar because they perceive it's an inflation hedge, then the dollar goes up. And the dollar going up merely reinforces the idea that it's an inflation hedge, and that suckers in more buying. And so it feeds on itself, and it becomes a self-perpetuating process. People think the dollar's a hedge, and therefore it becomes a hedge. But none of this fundamentally makes sense. The dollar is rising on the greater fool theory. Why are people buying dollars? Not because they need them to buy American products. They're buying them because they think some greater fool is going to pay a higher price for their dollars in the future. It's the same dynamic that's been going on with Bitcoin or anything else. People are just buying something because they have a belief that it's going to go up. And that can go on for only so long until ultimately the bubble pops. And that is what is going to happen to this dollar bubble because that's what it is. It is a massive self-reinforcing bubble where people are buying the dollar because it's going up. And because it's going up, people buy it. And now it becomes an inflation hedge. It becomes a store of value. Even though it's not storing any value in its primary market, in this speculative mania outside the United States, it looks like it's preserving a lot of value. Of course, if everybody who's hoarding these dollars tried to unload the dollars to get their own currencies back so they can actually buy goods and services, then the dollar would collapse. Now, as long as nobody wants to sell, everybody can live in a delusion that their dollars have appreciated. But if the world in mass decides they want to tap in to that paper gain and actually now use those dollars to buy goods and services, well, they got to sell them first to get whatever local currency they need. And then the bubble would implode. Although at some point it will collapse on its own accord before that happens. But in the meantime, that I think is the primary reason why you're not seeing the world rushing to gold. Because right now, the dollar looks like a much better alternative to gold. In fact, gold was down another 30 bucks on the week. Now, in terms of foreign currencies, it gained a little bit, I think, but not as much as the dollar. And so maybe gold is an okay inflation hedge if you live in Japan or you live in Germany, but the dollar appears to be an even better inflation hedge and the dollar pays a yield sure it's a small yield but at least on top of the appreciation there's icing on the cake gold pays no yield in fact a lot of people have to pay to have their gold stored for them so right now the dollar is stealing gold's luster i mean for a while it was bitcoin that everybody wanted instead of gold but now it's the dollar that everybody wants instead of gold. Now, eventually, people are going to figure out that they don't want the dollar, just like a lot of them figured out they don't want Bitcoin. There is ultimately going to be a rush into gold. As I've been saying, gold will be the last safe haven standing because it's the only true safe haven. And again, going back to the decade of the 1970s, which is the only real blueprint we have for what we're going to experience because this decade will be more highly inflationary than that one. But what happened to the price of gold? It went from $35 an ounce to $850. Now, I think something similar is going to happen this time, especially since I'm convinced that this decade is going to be more inflationary than that one. And because the U.S. began this decade in a much weaker financial position than it began the 1970s. And the prospect of a 1980-81 type conclusion 
where you have a Paul Volcker and a Ronald Reagan coming to the rescue, the odds of that happening are increasingly more remote. And even if you had that combination of individuals willing to do what needed to be done, it's so much more difficult to actually do it now, given the far more precarious financial position the country is in right now because of decade after decade of hollowing out our industrial base and quantitative easing one, two, three, four, given the entire bubble nature of our economy, it's really impossible to have the type of resolution that we had to the 1970s in this decade. So rather than ending the decade with a big victory over inflation, I think this decade is going to win with the victory going to inflation. America is going to lose the war that it won back in the 1980s. Now, in addition to news that inflation was getting stronger, we continue to get news that the economy is getting weaker. We got the weekly claims for first-time unemployment. And once again, we got a move up this time to 244,000 claims. That was an increase of 9,000 from the 235,000 from the prior week. The consensus was actually for a slight decline to 234. So we ended up with 10,000 more layoffs than the market was expecting. In fact, we're now at the highest level of new jobless claims since November of 2021. And I've been talking about this for a while now on my podcast, this gradual ratcheting up of the number of people who are losing their jobs. And this is clearly put in a trough. We are in an uptrend now in unemployment claims. The only question is, when are we going to accelerate off of this current trajectory and start to experience a more rapid degradation of the labor market. And that's going to happen any week. There's only so much bad news the economy can bear, the least of which is the Federal Reserve continuing to raise interest rates. Whether we get 75 basis points or 100 basis points in the July rate hike, that is going to exact a heavy toll on the consumer. In fact, if you look at the Atlanta Fed's estimate now for Q2 GDP, they just revised that down from minus 1.2 to minus 1.5. And that's almost as bad now as the minus 1.6 from the first quarter. But that is solid back-to-back negative quarters meaning that the economy is in a recession. Unless the Atlanta Fed is completely wrong here, the U.S. economy has been in recession all year. And earlier in the year, it was President Biden, it was Fed Chair Powell that were singing the praises of how strong the economy was. In fact, the economy was so super strong, it was going to shrug off these rate hikes. Well, clearly, it wasn't strong enough to shrug off the rate hikes. The economy is already in recession and interest rates are only one and a half percent. And what you have to ask yourself is if the economy is already in a recession when rates are still this low, what happens to the economy when rates are higher? I mean, clearly the recession is going to be much deeper when interest rates are higher. And clearly the layoffs that have already begun are going to massively accelerate as the recession gets worse. In fact, look at the industrial production numbers that came out for June. That was an unexpected decline. The consensus was for a 0.1% increase, and instead we had a 0.2% decrease. Manufacturing output, which was reported as down 0.1 in the prior month, that was revised to down 0.5. And in June, we were supposed to gain 0.2, and instead we lost another 0.5. So back-to-back 0.5% declines in manufacturing output. Not only does that show that the economy is weaker, but that means more pressure, upward pressure on prices, because if we're producing less, that means prices have to go up. 
you know, prices are a function of the supply of money, but also the supply of goods. And if we're not producing as much stuff, we have less stuff. And therefore, the price of that stuff has to go up. Look at capacity utilization. That went down. It was at 80.3 in the prior month. That was actually upwardly revised from 79, but it went down to 80% from that revision. But this was a weak number for industrial production. That's part of the reason that the Atlanta Fed reduced its GDP forecast. Now, one of the stronger numbers that we got during the week was retail sales on Friday. That was supposed to come out at up 0.9. This is for June, but we came out at up one. So a little bit stronger, but we know from the government that prices in June were up 1.3%. So if prices were up 1.3%, but sales were only up 1%. What does that mean about real sales? Well, they actually went down. We had a decline in retail sales, not an increase. Yes, consumers spent more money on the stuff they bought, but they bought less stuff. They just paid higher prices. They didn't buy more stuff. But of course, we know that the actual increase in consumer prices is much more than the 1.3% that the government is reporting. And that means that the actual decline in retail sales is much greater than what we're getting from these numbers. In addition to the retail sales numbers, another number that came out on Friday that the markets kind of liked was the consumer sentiment number, which rose from the floor. It was at an all-time record low last month of 50. And so we did get a small bounce to 51.1. So the markets were somewhat relieved that we didn't make a new low in sentiment by crashing below 50. But also, consumer expectations for inflation cooled off a bit. And I think that probably was the result of a decline in gasoline prices. There has been a bit of a decline in the past month. And so maybe that has raised a false sense of optimism on the part of consumers that there's some relief coming with respect to inflation. Now, the consumer is completely wrong. Inflation is going to get much worse. The fact that the consumer doesn't understand that doesn't change that. But you have a lot of people who still believe falsely that inflation is a function of expectations, that it's the expectation of inflation that causes inflation. And a lot of this thinking is coming from government to try to shift the blame away from themselves to the public. The idea is that if consumers think there's going to be inflation, they will behave differently. They will stock up on goods now to front run price increases, accelerating demand. They will demand raises from their employers and it will help push up wages and a wage price spiral. So a lot of this is expectation. Same with businesses. If businesses expect inflation, well, they'll raise their prices in anticipation of the expectation of inflation. And so the government tries to claim that this whole thing is psychological. It becomes the self-perpetuating process that the government is just an innocent bystander, that all the money they're printing is irrelevant. It's just these pesky expectations. And so when the markets see that the consumer is not expecting as much inflation, the initial reaction is, well, maybe the consumer's right, or maybe these lower expectations will actually produce less inflation. But the consumer is clueless. The consumer has no idea what he or she is talking about or thinking. The consumer is going to get blindsided by much higher inflation than what they expect. And the same thing is going to happen to investors. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and then using their services, it all made sense. 
There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They've cut out the cost of retail stores and they've passed on the sweet savings directly to their customers. Mint Mobile is a fraction of the cost of big wireless and it's perfect if you want to add a third or a fourth line for a young child. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. Mint Mobile gives you the best rates, whether you're buying just for yourself or for your entire family. And at Mint Mobile, families start at just two lines. Plus, all plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. So switch to Mint Mobile now and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and to get that plan shipped right to your front door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash gold. That's mintmobile.com slash gold. Cut your wireless bill of just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gold. Now, while the Fed has been making some progress with its rate hikes, albeit slow progress, and obviously if we get this 100 basis point rate hike this month and they're at 2.5%, they will have made some considerable progress in building a distance between zero and where the Fed funds rate is. But one place they haven't made any progress at all really is in shrinking the balance sheet. Now I did notice we had about a $40 billion reduction in the prior two weeks. But in the most recent week that was reported on Thursday, the size of the Fed's balance sheet actually rose by $4 billion. So as of right now, the Fed's balance sheet stands at $8 trillion $896 billion. So we're barely below $8.9 trillion. Now, we never got as high as $9 trillion. So we're barely below the absolute peak of the balance sheet. In fact, the highest the balance sheet got was just over $8,965,000,000 back in April. So the Fed hasn't even accomplished $70 billion in quantitative tightening. So even though in theory, the Fed started quantitative tightening at the beginning of June, here we are halfway through July, and you barely notice the difference in the size of the balance sheet. And that's because shrinking the balance sheet is actually going to be a lot more difficult than what the Fed believed. In fact, it's so difficult that it's not going to really happen. I mean, there's going to be some small adjustments in the balance sheet, but it's not going to be long before the Fed has to give up on the idea that it could shrink its balance sheet and it is going to be forced to expand the balance sheet, either because the Fed is going to be forced to fight recession, which we're already in, and which is gonna get worse, or they're gonna be put in a position where there is massive political pressure to stop interest rates from rising on US treasuries and other mortgage-backed securities, and they are going to have to monetize these exploding budget deficits. Because right now, the official budget deficit is forecast at around 1.8 trillion. But that forecast is based on the assumption that the economy is growing. It's not based on the reality that the economy is contracting because the dynamics of a recession as they impact the federal budget are very different than an expansion. Plus, the Fed is raising interest rates at a faster pace than what any of these budget guys were imagining when they came up with their forecast. And so the impact that higher rates are having on the budget deficit itself is much greater than what people were forecasting. Look, the House on Thursday voted to approve an $800 billion defense authorization spending package. This is actually more money than the Biden administration requested. I mean, the Senate did the same thing. They are authorizing even more money than Biden wants to spend on defense. Where is this $800 billion going to come from? It has to be borrowed. All of it has to be borrowed. That is more pressure 
on the Federal Reserve to monetize that debt to create even more inflation. Here you have all these politicians claiming they want to fight inflation, yet they're spending a record amount of borrowed money on national defense. Where are the cuts in the defense spending to help fight inflation? There are none. They want to spend more money on defense. But to add insult to injury, not only do they want to spend more money on defense, but they basically want to force everybody else to spend more money because buried inside this bill is an official law to require all government contractors to pay their workers $15 an hour. Now, Biden had done something by executive order to that effect, but now it's going to be codified into law that the minimum wage for anybody contracting with the U.S. government is $15 an hour. Now, this is also inflationary, just like the $800 billion in deficit spending is inflationary. It's either inflationary because the Fed has to print the money or because there's crowding out. If the Fed doesn't buy the bonds, somebody in the private sector does. And if they're buying treasuries, they're not loaning money to corporations. And so capital investment is going to have to be crowded out in order to make room for the deficits to finance the fans. And that means higher prices. We're producing less stuff. We need to produce more stuff to help combat upward pressure on prices. Not less stuff, but bigger government deficit spending crowds out private investment. And so you get less stuff. And if it doesn't crowd it out, it's because we printed more money and that directly contributes to inflation. But what this $15 an hour minimum requirement is going to do, it is going to raise the price that the U.S. military pays for everything that it buys because it's just ordered its contractors to pay people $15 an hour. Now, maybe they're paying people $10 an hour or $12 an hour right now. So all those people are going to have to get raises. Well, that means all these contractors are going to have to increase the price they're charging the government to buy all this stuff because they're all paying higher wages. And so now that means the U.S. government has to run an even bigger deficit to buy all the stuff that it's buying. But the ramifications of this go way beyond the government. Because all employers have to compete with defense contractors. If defense contractors are going into the labor pool and paying unskilled workers $15 an hour, well, other companies now have to pay $15 an hour to get workers. Otherwise, they're going to go to defense contractors. So you have this upward pressure on wages throughout the economy as a result of this law. Now, if the government really was wanting to fight inflation, would it be mandating higher wages across the economy that are simply going to add to the price pressures in the economy? Of course not. The truth of the matter is, it's good politics to talk about fighting inflation. It's horrible politics to actually fight it, which is why it's not going to happen. As I've been saying, inflation is the tax we pay to pay for government spending. But it's a hidden tax. It's an invisible tax. It's the tax that most people don't object to because they don't realize that they're being taxed. And there's no way the politicians are going to replace that secret hidden tax with an obvious overt tax that the public knows they have to pay. The only way to fight inflation is to cut government spending, which means people who are getting a check have to get a smaller check or no check at all. Or they have to increase taxes. So in order for Americans to have less inflation, they have to pay higher income taxes or they have to pay a higher sales tax. But they don't want to do that. And the government doesn't want to impose those higher taxes. Yeah, there are people who are willing to impose higher taxes on the rich because that's easy because the rich people don't have a lot of votes. The middle class, that's where all the votes are. And nobody wants to tax those voters in a way that the voters know they're being taxed. And so all the politicians prefer taxing them with inflation, but then they want to blame the inflation on somebody else and promise relief from inflation because that's exactly what the public wants to hear. 
but never actually deliver that relief because they can't do it without leveling with the American public and actually letting them know that they have to pay for all this government spending. In fact, not even the Republicans are willing to level with the American public about what it's going to take to fight inflation. Sure, they're willing to blame it all on Biden, but they're not willing to accept any of the responsibility or acknowledge any of the bitter tasting medicine that needs to be swallowed because we had huge deficit spending under Donald Trump too. It's not that we just started doing it under Biden. No, I mean, Biden's just doing more of it, but both Democrats and Republicans have been deficit spending. In fact, you have a lot of Republicans who want this extra $800 billion defense spending bill. They're not saying, oh, we can't spend this money because it's inflationary. No, they don't care about the budget deficits. They care about the defense contractors. They want their political support. They couldn't care about the budget deficits. They couldn't care about inflation. And that was true long before Biden became president. In fact, I was watching an interview with Art Laffer. He was interviewed by Kitco News at Freedom Fest, which is going on now in Las Vegas. I had been going to Freedom Fest for many, many years, but since COVID, I haven't gone back. And obviously, this week I have COVID myself, and so I clearly couldn't go to Freedom Fest, but I wasn't even planning on going this year, even before I came down with COVID. So I'm not really sure when I'm going to start doing these conferences again. But Art Laffer was there and was talking about inflation and, of course, blaming it on Biden. Now, the one thing about Art Laffer, I still have not got my penny from Art Laffer that he lost to me in that bet that he made with me on the Kudlow show back in 2006. But more important than the penny was the note that he promised to write me, admitting that he was wrong and I was right. I have yet to receive that official acknowledgement from Art Laffer. And the problem was Art Laffer back then really did not understand the dynamics at play in the economy. And his understanding is no better now because he thinks that it's very easy to get rid of inflation. He was talking about the solution and about how they handled it back in 1980 when he was part of the Reagan administration. And he's saying that we just need to do the same thing again today, but that the people at the Federal Reserve are a bunch of fools. They're incompetent. And I may agree with him there, but I agree with him for different reasons. But he's saying that these guys are just incompetent. They don't understand that we need positive real interest rates and that all we need to do is have a Fed chairman like Paul Volcker to let interest rates rise to their natural level somewhere above the official inflation rate, right, of 9% or whatever. Just let interest rates go to 10%, 11%, 12%, wherever they're going to go. That's all we have to do and we're going to be able to solve the inflation problem without creating a recession because he denied that a recession is a necessary part of the cure, that we don't need a recession. We just need to let interest rates rise above the inflation rate, and then we can get rid of inflation without a recession. What is he talking about? How can we have interest rates go up, let's say, to 12%? without that in and of itself creating a recession. In fact, it wouldn't just create a recession. It would create the worst recession we've ever had. It would create a much worse financial crisis than we had in 2008, which in and of itself would create a recession. You see, Art Laffer still doesn't understand that we have this entire phony bubble economy that only can survive if we have really low interest rates. And the only reason we have really low interest rates is because the Federal Reserve is artificially suppressing them. The Federal Reserve is not doing what he knows is necessary to fight inflation because we can't do it. He knows how to fight inflation, but the problem is we can't do it without unleashing a massive recession. You can't prick the bubble without the air coming out of the bubble. And if we're going to go from a bubble economy to a real economy, 
during that transition, a lot of money is going to get lost. A lot of jobs are going to get lost. There is no way to stop that from happening. People need to lose the wrong jobs before they can get the right jobs. Now, how much time is going to transpire between losing the wrong job and getting the right job? I don't know. Obviously, the government can elongate that time by interfering with the economy and slowing down the process. But to think that we can just go from where we are to where we need to be without a recession is pie-in-the-sky fantasy. And for Art Laffer to try to claim that there's a solution here, a painless solution, where we magically avoid a recession— But the only reason we're going to have a recession is because these idiots at the Federal Reserve don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing, but we need a recession in order to fix all the mistakes that they helped the economy to create. But what actually made it worse is not only did Art Laffer think that we could just let interest rates rise all the way up there and it's not going to have a problem, not going to cause a recession, but his other solution for the current inflation problem was tax cuts. Now, as far as Art Laffer is concerned, whatever the problem is, tax cuts are the solution, right? He's never met a problem that he didn't think could be cured with a tax cut, even if the problem is a big budget deficit. According to Art Laffer, if you have a big budget deficit, then you cut the revenues to the federal government. And by his own Laffer curve, that's going to automatically mean that the government is going to get additional revenue at lower tax rates. When Reagan lowered taxes in 1981, the top federal tax bracket was at 70%. So you had a confiscatorily high upper tax bracket with all sorts of reasons to try to avoid generating taxable income. And there were lots of deductions in the code that people were able to take advantage of. Now, the initial tax cut from Reagan was to reduce that rate from 70% to 50%. And in the process, eliminating some of those deductions. So obviously that was a positive step that did enable some additional revenue to be generated from a income tax that was less confiscatory than one that had a 70% bracket. Now that 20% decline from 70% to 50% was about a 29% decrease in the top marginal rate of tax. But then Reagan followed up on that tax cut with another tax cut during his second term where the rates went from 50% down to 28%. That was another 44% decline in the marginal rate. And again, more deductions were eliminated to broaden the base and lower the rate. But if you look at the total reduction in the marginal tax rate from 70% to 28%, what would we have to do today to have something similar? Because that's really what Laffer was advocating for during that interview, Reagan-style tax cuts to combat inflation the way we combated it back then because he said the tax cuts unleashed productivity. We ended up producing more stuff, and that's how we overcame the inflation. We increased the supply of goods and services, keeping a lid on prices. Well, in order to have that magnitude of a decline from 70% to 28%, the current top bracket is 37. Now, that doesn't include the Obamacare, Medicare tax at 3.9, but just looking at the official income tax, the top rate of 37%, we would have to go down to 15.5% from 37% to have the same percentage decline, but we don't have the ability to eliminate the deductions because almost all those deductions have been eliminated. I mean, you have a few more that they could get rid of, but nowhere near what was on the table back then. So there would be no way for the U.S. government to lower the top income tax bracket from 37 to 15 and a half and have it be a positive for the U.S. Treasury. And of course, if we lower the top rate to 15 and a half, what is the government going to do with all the other rates? I mean, they're going to have to be slashed even more. In fact, a lot of people who are currently paying income taxes would end up paying no income taxes at all. Now, I'm not in favor of the income tax at all. I'd like to get rid of the income tax, but 
if we're going to get rid of the income tax, we have to first get rid of the government that the income tax supports. During that entire interview that Art Laffer gave, he never once mentioned the need to cut any government spending. He said that all we have to do is cut taxes, that we could take our massive budget deficits and make them even bigger. And somehow that's going to fight inflation. And that's going to allow us to fight inflation without having to experience a recession. All of that was sheer nonsense coming from Art Laffer. Now, at least Art Laffer understands where inflation comes from. But the problem is when you have guys like Art Laffer, who are supposed to be one of the good guys, spewing all of this nonsense, how do we combat all the lies? How do we tell the public the truth? Because if the Republicans aren't willing to level with the public, who will? And again, remember, the Republicans, when they're out of power, yes, sure, they'll talk about the big deficits and all the money printing and the government spending until they have power. And the minute they have the power back, they do exactly what they criticize the Democrats for doing. And one of the reasons is because of this kind of BS. Nobody wants to accept responsibility for what really has to be done. Nobody wants to level with the voters and let them know that there is no such thing as a free lunch. Well, believe me, a Republican free lunch is every bit as expensive as the ones the Democrats are serving up. And if you don't want to be stuck picking up that tab, then you've got to take decisive action to continue to protect yourself from this threat. Inflation is not going away. There is no quick fix. So there is no fix. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. And those who are taking temporary shelter in the U.S. dollar abroad because they think it's the cleanest dirty shirt in the hamper are in for a rude awakening when they get a good whiff of that stench. And the smart money is recognizing that though it's underperforming now, gold is a far superior store of value inflation hedge than the U.S. dollar. You don't have to choose the lesser of an evil. You can choose good over evil. You can choose real money over fake money. And that means not only is gold super cheap right now, but those mining stocks are are cheaper beyond belief. You know, remember how much those stocks collapsed back in March of 2020. They were imploding even faster then than they are now. And that decline made no sense either. And it didn't last. And those stocks had a vicious recovery and recovered everything they had lost and then some. And it's my expectation that the same thing is going to happen again. Now, I didn't believe that we would see such a big drop in gold stocks in the face of surging inflation. But once again, you know, I'm surprised by the market's failure to understand and grasp reality. But even though the markets don't grasp reality sooner, they do grasp it eventually. And it's during that intermittent time period where there's both the opportunity to screw up if you end up getting scared out of your positions and you sell because you're worried about these paper losses, or you have a real opportunity to take advantage of other people's foolishness or maybe simply their circumstances of being over leveraged and being forced to sell what they would rather be buying. And you can buy yourself and ultimately look back on what happened today and during this time period as having been an incredible buying opportunity. I am confident that that's how we're going to look back on this period. And that's why, in my mind, nothing has changed. Everything that is happening makes perfect sense. What's happening is exactly what I expected to happen. It's just that the way I expected other investors to react to what's happening, that's what's unexpected. But ultimately, it's the people who don't really understand what they're reacting to, who will eventually figure it out. The people who have already figured it out aren't going to suddenly become dumb. It's all of those people who have been so foolish who are going to eventually wise up. Mm -hmm.